Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 208 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Marquis, and today we are going to be doing an interview with a special guest, Kurt Jepson, who is a physical therapist. We're going to be talking about some of the changes in PT over the last 30 years. We'll be going over some of the importance of mentorship, which I think is very important. We'll be talking about experience over evidence and vice versa. And we'll also be talking about Kurt's experience as a physical therapist in the realm of the Olympics and at the Olympic level, uh, which I think will be quite interesting. And then we're going to do a little round of rapid fire questions for Kurt just to keep him on his toes today. Um, so before we get started, though, I'd like to just take a moment to hear a word from our sponsors. Welcome back, everyone. So before we get rolling here, um, I just want to start off with a little background on how I got to know Kurt. And, um, you know, we, we go back 30 years now, and I was in college. I had had um, a couple of clinicals. My first two clinicals were not my first choices, but uh, they ended up becoming excellent clinicals and in, in acute care and rehab and whatnot, and some orthopedics. Then when it came, came, came down to the third clinical, there were 20 people applying to go to Kurt's practice at Saco Bay Sports and Orthopedics. And I was one of them who wanted to get in. And so come to find out, uh, you couldn't just kind of apply for that clinical. You needed to be interviewed so I uh, run down to Saco Bay Sports and Orthopedics and I get grilled from top to bottom by Kurt. It was question after question after question. And, um, you know, it was it was great. You know, I, I loved it. I loved the challenge. And uh, I did well enough where I was able to get in on that clinical. And it was really one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. I think that having that clinical really jump started my career and got me on my feet quickly. And as a new grad, I was ready to go right from the time I started my first job. And so um, with that, I would like to thank Kurt and I would like to welcome you to the show. And thank you so much for being on the show today, Kurt. You bet, Paul. Happy to be here. So you know, it's, uh, it's been fun. I mean, uh, for 30 years, I've been contacting you, you know, when I have these tough questions and uh, you've always been there as a mentor for me and uh, really a great guy. Kurt's a super smart guy. Um, and I, he, he really has always been there to answer my questions. Really appreciate that, Kurt. We're going to, uh, that's all the accolades I can take. I'm going to disappoint you here, Paul, I think, as we continue this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be fun. We're just going to, you know, we're, we're winging this today. And, um, and I think that's exactly how he has to be. Um, we're going, um, uh, right from top to bottom here. We could talk all day on multiple levels and on multiple topics. Uh, but what I'd like to do here is just give the folks out there uh, a little more background besides what we have in your bio. Talk to me about the last, uh, you know, 30, 35 years about what you've been doing, how you got started in physical therapy and, and where you're at now. Well, this, uh, the quick story is... Um... Played uh, varsity sports at Bates College. Had a had an injury um, to uh, to my right hip. I think my junior year, um, and spent most of that the tail part of that season in the training room at Bates. Uh, and actually, the athletic trainer there was also a physical therapist. And uh, I was a Penn State grad. Uh, and the things John was doing. Um, Thought were interesting. I was always kind of a science guy. I thought I wanted to go to veterinarian school, actually. Um, and all the stuff he was doing uh, to try and get me up and running, I thought was really interesting. The things he was talking about seemed interesting. Interesting. And actually, John uh, went on to uh, apply to the first UNE University of New England osteopathic class. He was in the first graduating osteopathic physician class uh, after he left uh, left his Bates career. Uh, so that kind of get me started with the idea after after Bates that I might want to pursue this whole sports medicine rehab side of things. And uh, after a couple of years of of uh, teaching high school and uh, ski bumming around, I uh, went to UNE, got out in '85, um, and knew I wanted to get away from New England for a little bit. So I took my first job down in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and worked for uh, a couple of surgeons down there. Spent about three years down there, knowing at some point I wanted to come back to, to Maine and open, uh, hang, my, hang my own shingle. 
which happened in 1988, I think, was the first office of Saco Bay Orthopedic and Sports PT in Saco. Uh, and I, uh, my first uh, partner, Larry Rizzigo, who was a classmate, uh, opened shop and then uh, that practice uh, over the subsequent years and, and to multi, uh, multi-site conservation of, uh, I believe, uh, a dozen sites. Uh, after which we were acquired uh, by Select Medical Board. 2012, uh, some, a few years already. It's hard to believe it's been that many years. Um, and continued to work uh, for uh, Select Medical until this past March when I retired from uh, clinical work and uh, I've just kind of tried to get a couple of side hustles going to just to, to stay in it. So. Uh, I think, it's, I think it's tough when you spend, uh, in my case, about 35 years uh, doing doing something. It's it's hard, even though it, it seems time chronologically uh, to hang things up. Your uh, your entire identity sometimes revolves around uh, what you've done for work, and uh, if you like it, you just don't want to leave, let it go entirely. So uh, so that's I guess this new venture is my way of trying to uh, keep my hands in it a bit uh, until. Uh, well, it's time for uh, for a plot somewhere. Yep. Sure, <laughs> uh, that's great. So, Kurt, I know that you have a ton of experience, and um, you've always been that type of guy. I remember this when I was a student of yours. Uh, we, we would review and review and review the research, and um, everything was evidence based. We really, uh, you pounded that into me really hard when we were uh, when I was a student of yours, and, and I remember working hard. And for those of you who are young therapists, I'm going to tell you right now, or even young medical medical providers, you could be a an NP or a PA uh, or OT PT doesn't matter. When you're young and you're a student and you're you're going through it, you. You can't just go to clinical and think you're going to go to uh, an eight to four, eight to five job, and uh, it's just going to be easy sailing. I remember working with Kerr. We were there at six in the morning till six at night and prepping everything in the morning, getting things going, treating patients all day, sometimes through lunch, and then you know cleaning up the clinic and taking care of business afterwards and making sure that it was ready for the next day. And uh, you know, I remember going home working on paperwork till 11 o'clock at night, uh, Kurt would correct it, you know, and make sure that I was on the right track and uh, really mentored me through that and pushed hard. And it wasn't easy. And I, I think that that's important that you go above and beyond, especially as a student, uh, when you're on clinical, to really uh, make an impression and uh, to learn as much as you can and to absorb as much as you can from the experienced people that are around you. So, um, you know, so Kurt has always been great at working hard, number one, and always looking at the, the evidence. So my question to you, Kurt, over the years, the 35 years that you've worked as a therapist, have you ever felt that experience trumped some of the evidence that was coming out? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, I would say that's happened. Um, I think probably one of the most, uh, one of the easiest things for me to remember was in the course of ACL rehab. Uh, when back in, I don't know, came up from North Carolina in the late eighties. So I'd say by the mid nineties, maybe, um, you know, there was a, a big change to closed chain exercise for ACLs. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a BTB, um, you know, obviously there's a, a high morbidity rate for the patellofemoral mechanism with that kind of thing. Um, and it just seemed to me like all, with all this closed chain activity, uh, since you're dealing with a traumatized harvest site, why would you treat that body part 180 degrees from how you would treat a jumper's knee? Neuropathy, say, for instance, um, by doing internal extension, closed chain stuff, where you are, you know, seeding the infrapatellar region in the, in the femoral groove, you know, which happens based on who you read, you know, 20, 30 degrees, or you know, you're on up to zero, and so you have an ir irritated tissue from being harvested, and then you're going to just irritate it further by making it seed itself in the femoral groove from 20 to zero degrees over and over again. And I just noticed, you know, a high percentage of my people just developing anterior knee pain um, post-op. 
um, a higher percentage than when I was seeing people in the 80s um, doing open chain stuff, starting that way. And I said, that, you know, this whole closed chain thing makes sense. When you look at the research <clears throat> and you look at that surrogate robotic models or you look at the surrogate cadaver studies and it all makes kinematic sense, but I'm not seeing that in the clinic in terms of results and outcomes. I'm battling issues here that, <clears throat> that I think I would probably not have if I was reverting back to some of the open chain activities. Um, so that was always a bone of contention, uh, trying to convince referral sources that, you know, I get all this closed chain protocol stuff, but it's not helping these people. You know, uh, you're, you're slowing down the quad rehab process by initiating telephone rehabilitation, some of this stuff. And, you know, hard sell for sure. Um, but <clears throat> I think now, if you look at today's literature, a lot of the, a lot of the protocols are, are reinitiating isolated quad re-education activation in open chain positions that are non-hazardous to the, uh, to, to the graph, uh, no matter what the graph is, i.e., you know, submaximal isometrics at 90 degrees or, you know, uh, just staying away from that translation, that maximal translation point in your terminal extension. And it's funny how when you're in a profession long enough, those things run full circle. So yeah. I think I think where people are now are back where things were in the late 80s, mid, mid to late 80s. Yeah. And it, this is so interesting because uh, for all of you who are listening today, Kurt and I put this together really, really last minute. I didn't even send him a set of questions for this. And uh, he is... He's answering this exactly. I was gonna, I was gonna kind of fall into asking you the question about how the ACL and rehab has turned in the last 30 years. And I very clearly remember treating patients in the open chain when I first started treating ACLs. And we had this high, very high success rate with people getting back to sports, getting back to sports. Um, at a decent time uh, and uh, not having any re-injuries, not having any re-rupture rates. I mean, they were very, very few and far in between. And then like, you know, 15 years ago, it seemed like everybody was re-rupturing and there was a high failure rate and there was this big shift like you were talking about. And, um, and now it seems like everybody's talking about open chain knee extension. I just gave a course with Susie Lachowski on blood flow restriction training recently. And so uh, we we're just giving them some examples of when you can start using blood flow restriction. And so I asked the people who were in the crowd, I said, how many people here avoid open chain knee extension two weeks after ACL reconstruction? And everybody put their hands up. And I said, well, why is that? And they all said, you know what? we would expect to hear is that it puts a lot of tension on the ACL graft and, and blah, blah, blah. And so I say, well, you know, what's more important here, you know, putting a little bit of tension on there or activating, you know, the quad and we, we need that quad activated. So that was a great example of where we could start using blood flow restriction really early on without loading the tibia distally and not putting so much stress on that ACL. And so it's just kind of funny how uh, I, I found that as we started to avoid that open chain strengthening that uh, people didn't do quite as well. And so we're, we're back on track. And I think, like you said, it's coming uh, um, right back around and uh, it's been interesting, but I, I totally agree with you. I think there are times where um, experience does trump the evidence and, uh, and we need to look at the evidence and we definitely need to follow it. And I think it's a great way to guide protocols, but, um, you, when you, when you've seen a thing or two, you know, and, um, and it works for you, sometimes you just need to stick with it. And I think in this particular topic, you know, you look at some of the, the research coming out now, looking at testing techniques in terms of what kind of functional tests you do before you release an athlete back to back to a, a game ready situation and uh, comparing closed chain functional tests, um, re-rupture rates versus uh, the old isokinetic uh, testing for quadri isolated quadriceps activity. And uh, you know, a lot of the studies uh, show that you, know, you can pass a functional closed chain test of you know, hop, skip, jump, step ups, uh, balance activities, whatever one kid, whatever kinematic challenge you want to throw at that athlete, they can pass it um, and look symmetrical and measure symmetrical in terms of height and distance and reps and time and whatever you're doing. Uh, throw them on an isolated isokinetic machine, and the quad can be 35% off. 
and look at re-rupture rates uh, associated with the weak isolated fluorocytes and you know, it really sets you up for failure. Um, so you know, it's funny how, how uh, rehab techniques drive a testing procedure that is solely based on the techniques you were just using and you get stuck into this little box where, yeah, of course you're gonna pass that test like what you've been doing for rehab, but does that mean that when you expose that joint to different forces uh, that are higher, different planes, of, you know, force vectors, whatever, is that going to be able? You're going to be able to stabilize that. Um, yeah. And you know, I think part of the answer is, well, I don't know. If you get a certain get a 30 percent plus efficiency, no, there's going to be a problem there mechanically for sure. So, so uh, yeah, I, I'd say that's in terms of of you know anecdotal gut feeling over what's the current trend in the literature and that's probably the best example i can i can think of over the last 30 years for sure 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 absolutely that was the first one that came to my mind too when i asked you the question so it's a kind of funny when you're thinking of the same thing um kurt you you've had some experience working at the olympics um can you fill us in a little bit on how you got there i'm sure you didn't like just raise your hand and say i'd like to go to the olympics and then you were able to go um what kind of process was that how did you get involved then um and tell us a little bit about what that was like when you were there um it was a classic example of it's who you know not what you know um i i was doing some uh, teaching for the american academy of family physicians which is uh, the second largest physician group behind the AMA um, and uh, actually got connected with that group through uh, a buddy, Barney Poole, down in uh, Georgia, who uh, was at the Houston Sports Medicine Clinic. Uh, and I interned with, with Barney, my last rotation down in Atlanta. Um, so I kept in touch with him, got kind of chummy and, and um, he had connections through Houston Sports Medicine at the to uh, get involved with this, you know, this academic endeavor, and we would go out uh, um, from started in the early '90s and spent about ten years going out uh, teaching family practice physicians um, about rehab techniques or various sports medicine topics. Uh, and every year they had an annual conference somewhere in the country, and part of the educational process was a rehab component. So Barney and I would, would kind of do that. One of the, one of the positions on faculty staff, um, the guy named Wade Lillegaard from Duluth, Minnesota, and he was a ski team, a uh, Nordic ski team doc, uh, volunteer pool. So um, he just said one day, you're from Maine, you must ski. And I said, yeah, I'm ski. And he said, we thought about working with the, the ski team. And he said, let me think about it. And, Two seconds later, I said, "Yeah, we can do that." So, uh, so he uh, he uh, started uh, gave me the name of the U.S. Ski Team Medical Director, um, who at the time was a, a physician assistant, actually in in uh, Utah, named Melinda Rolstad. And uh, had some conversations with Melinda, and uh, kind of a you know phone interview process, and uh, put together uh, an application packet, to become a volunteer for the U.S. ski team, uh, which for people I'm sure probably um, the U.S. ski team has nothing to do with the Olympic Committee. It's a governing body just like U.S. bobsled is a governing body for bobsledding and U.S. figure skating is a na national governing body for figure skaters. And the, the only time that the national governing body of that sport doesn't have a lot of say in what goes on with staffing and medical coverage is an Olympic year. That, in that Olympic year, the U.S. Olympic Committee kind of takes over every sport and their national governing bodies uh, start to lose say in terms of um, coaching staff and medical provision. And, uh, so, and the Olympic Committee tries to, to, to keep the national governing body staffs, so obviously coaches, uh, named athletes to the upper echelon teams, whatever. Um, to be able to go to the Olympics. There, there's definitely some things that, that are different. Um, so for the 2002 games, um, I, because the United States Olympic Committee did not recognize physical therapists as being qualified medical pool providers, um, they only used athletic trainers in that role. Um, because of that, of that stringent criteria, 
uh, even board certified SESs weren't really considered a viable uh, personnel for that role. Um, I actually went to the Salt Lake Games on a wax tech um, certification. So I basically was uh, was given a service tech bib to be able to get into venues and got on the uh, the named list of people be able to travel to the U.S. Keeping as a wax tech. Uh, so that's how I got my credential there. Um, and the uh, U.S. ski team medical director, Melinda, after those 2002 games, and now this is really we need to start petitioning uh, the Olympic Committee to, to recognize sports uh, certified specialist PTs as viable practitioners and to be able to get a U.S. OC credential to travel with the sports teams as part of the U.S. Olympic Committee medical entourage. So she made a few phone calls and we started that whole process. Um, so that included a two week stint in Colorado Springs, uh, which is kind of a tryout that I had to do. I think I did that in the fall of 2005, getting ready for the 2006 Torino games. Um, and that was a great experience for sure. Um, but uh, after that experience, the final decision had been made, hadn't been made yet as to whether uh, they were going to honor physical therapists as true medical providers or not. Um, and the word came down sometime probably in December of that year that, uh, that the committees involved uh, had, uh, had met and decided to, for the first time in the history of the, of the U.S. Olympic Committee, to recognize board certified sports PTs as viable you know, practitioners to be able to travel with United States Olympic Committee teams. Um, and uh, I believe I was the first person in the country to land in that in that role. And that, nice, uh, awesome. That was that was kind of the achieving part of my career, I guess, just to know that that uh, that work. Um, you know, I don't I don't know how much it was my tryout and you know what I had done for the for the ski team over the all the previous years at World Cups and. Obviously, a good relationship with the medical director and uh, the team physicians and uh, the Colorado Springs situation certainly was a good, good situation. But uh, it was nice to know that that, that door had been opened now to uh, board certified sports PTs to be able to at least stick their uh, pull their hat in the ring to try and be selected to travel with uh, winter and summer game uh, teams. Uh, and there have been uh, there have been since then. Um, and, you know, a lot of those PTSCSs are also ATCs. And, you know, in prior years, they had already they had, they had gone to Olympic Games under their ATC um, qualification, but not their PTSCS qualifications. So just, yeah. just to know that, uh, that I'm not an ATC. Um, just to know that, you know, future PTs with SESs um, might be able to, to have the experiences that I was able to have um, yeah. in Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it all started, and then I spent uh, about 18 years with the U.S. ski team, and uh, um, I don't know, probably eight or ten world championships and too many World Cups to uh, to name, remember, and uh, you know, three Olympic Games, one as a wax tech, and uh, two as a <laughs> as a USO, USOC provider, medical provider. Well, that's absolutely spectacular and, and kudos to you for, you know, putting in that work and, and you know, paving the way. <clears throat> that's absolutely excellent. Um, so, you know, let's let's stick with this uh, this Nordic theme here. And uh, for those of you who know Kurt, um, Kurt was born with skis on and um, and he's skied pretty much all his life. And uh, tell us a little bit more about this this recent endeavor of yours uh, regarding Nordic skiing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just kind of, I'm trying to fill the gap between, uh, so what, what I've done since leaving the clinical practice full time is, uh, just to set up a little side hustle, uh, where, uh, patients who uh, have been discharged from physical therapy, uh, post-op or, or concerted management. And, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this, Paul, in your practice as well, where people, uh, you know, try and go back to sport and within a month they're back in your office saying, yeah, I tried to go back to play tennis, but I, it just cleared things up again. And even though the therapist said I was all done and great and the doc signed off on me, everything's fine, go out and do what you want to do. 
um, I it got irritated. Um, and I, I think there's a, a tendency, perhaps, um, in certain situations where, where folks are under rehab. I think uh, particularly those people who want to get back to a vigorous recreational pursuit, whether it be tennis, uh, skiing, um, whatever it might be. Uh, so so I, I'm trying to fill that void where people leave uh, a physical therapy situation. Um, you know, they may have gone through outcome testing or not. Uh, they may have passed their test successfully, but in, in the prior example, for instance, you know, maybe they still have a 30% isolated weakness somewhere, or um, you know, they need ongoing activation of musculature. You take a, a total hip uh, uh, person who, you know, is going to suffer from glute amnesia forever, and if you don't, you know, actively pursue situation in a gym or a very vigorous home uh, exercise situation where at least once or twice a week you're reactivating those those you know, those feedback loops uh, you're probably going to come down with a glute irritation um, at some point as you start to get back into your sport so uh, my idea is i think people leave particularly post-op people leave pt um, with a hand uh, a handout for home exercise stuff but uh, when they go back to their gyms, if they have a gym, they're not quite sure what they should be should be and should not be doing based on their, their surgical procedure and their tentative, and maybe not have gotten a lot of feedback from um, the, the last uh, person they saw in their physician's office, which was probably not the doc. Um, and you know, from their PT, they may or may not have had you know, really really good guidance in terms of uh, what to do long term to return to their specific. So it's kind of a Kind of a bridge. I'm trying to be a bridge between uh, the end of their uh, their formal clinical setting rehab and getting them back to their, their high end performance sport um, in the long term in terms of what they need to do in the gym. So basically, it's it's uh, it's a gym based uh, program based on uh, you know I'm a big equipment gym guy. I think it's I think um, and you can use body weight, you can use home things, but in terms of of the recruitment stimulus you need to get those neural neural pathways established for strength gain or uh, continue those pathways uh, or prophylactic uh, side of things. Uh, I think gyms are the best way. Most of them are available for me. Um, Great. And, uh, so that's uh, that's what I do. I take them to the gym, set them up with a with a program. Uh, they go off to their own gym. Do the stuff, get them back every couple of weeks for uh, objective uh, testing, make sure they're uh, where they need to be, and uh, just monitor problems and get them in the mindset that this is a life uh, commitment for me to be able to keep playing uh, playing golf or tennis or ski at the level I want to. I've got to go to my gym once or twice a week and just do this as part of my life. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that's, and that's kind, of, kind of where it is. Yeah, and I think I think that uh, this works really well in the sports realm, but you can always carry this over too into you know people who are are working out there and doing physical labor and and whatever it is they do for a job. Um, you know, we we use the sports medicine approach, and I, unfortunately, a lot of people out there you know have thought of us yourself and and, and your practice and our practice as you know training people to become Olympians. And I think that when we say that we use a sports medicine approach, it's just that it's bridging that gap from rehab to getting back to that sport or rehab and getting back to that job. Um, you know, we've had people who have to change cutting blades in mills and they need to be able to, to lift up to two, three, four tons of blades in the course of, you know, a couple of hours. And so we need to train them to be able to do that activity and simulate it as much as possible, as safely as possible with body mechanics and very specific training and stuff like that. So um, I really, I really like that concept. And I think there is a definite need, especially for those people who just want to continue to, to fuel their fire, you know, and, uh, and those who are passionate about doing what they want to do. Um, unfortunately, as we get older, we break down a little bit and we need some fine tuning and, um, and, and that's where this is, is really beneficial. So I hope this just catches on and, and grows, um, not just in your area, but, you know, into, uh, other, other locations. Right. But I think, I think there's a, a real tendency for people, um, and, and for patients to get advice from practitioners that, you know, once you get back into your sport, hundred percent, the sport will keep you strong and where you need to be. Well, you know, 
people like I hear that comment all the time where, you know, well, I go back to playing my sport and that should keep me fit. That should keep me strong where I need to be strong. And that should, you know, keep everything all right. And, you know, my, my classic rebuttal to that is, well, if that was the case, there would be no such thing as sports medicine. If athletes play in their sport, that's all they needed to like stay strong and healthy and specifically conditioned uh, just by participating in their sport or their rigorous job, where it might be, none of us would have a job. We would all, you know, we would never see these people right? because yep. there's never a biomechanical flaw. There's never a weakness that raises its ugly head uh, because they're playing their sport. They're always going to be fine. And we know obviously that's not, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not always about treatment, but it's about management. You know, um, we can, we can treat till we're blue in the face. If we don't have a good diagnosis, number one, the treatment isn't going to be successful. And um, sometimes we just need to uh, look at, you know, how do we manage these situations a little bit better? And uh, that way that can take you into a different, you know, direction. So oftentimes, uh, you know, we see people who uh, come into the clinic and we think that we have to do something with them all the time. Like, like we have the answer to it and that we have to treat it, but uh, sometimes catching something early, you know, and, and people say that PTs can't be diagnosticians, that you shouldn't be diagnosed. They always taught that us in school, you know, you, you can't give a diagnosis and uh, that's a bunch of BS. Uh, when you get an order that comes in or a referral that comes in and says shoulder pain or hip pain, I mean, there's a multitude of diagnoses here that we can be playing with. And uh, we have to really put on our detective caps and uh, do a lot of work to sort and sift all that out so we can offer the best treatment possible out there. Well, that's really the fun. In my mind, that's the, the most rewarding and the fun part of PT is being a detective. Like I said, you know, I love that term just because... Uh, you know, if you if you worked off a referral sheet, um, just think how boring your day would be if you took uh, everything you see in a referral sheet as as face value, and that's the problem. And go ahead and, and apply your PT guy driven uh, interventions for that that particular situation. What a boring work day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, diving in deeper, having the and you know, and to dive in deeper, you need to a be inquisitive. Uh, you need to power the operative note, make sure that every little um, invasion of tissue, you know, might be a future symptom site. And, you know, knowing procedure in terms of what you need to be protective of and what you don't need to be protective of and, and getting that information. Uh, and then having, you know, a very, very sound anatomic and kinesiologic education behind you to, you know, draw those correlations and, and to be a good detective in terms of, yeah, this hurts. Why, you know, why, well, or this makes no sense whatsoever. Let's, let's wander down some other, some other road. So, um, and then, and that's where the, the lifelong learning process really starts is knowing that, uh, you know, you're never going to know everything. You're never going to be a Merck manual where you just have everything memorized and at your ready to draw from. You're always reading, you're always reviewing, um, and then things change. You know, apparatus change, surgical techniques change. Um, you know, so so that's that's kind of the that's kind of the, the fun of it all, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you just hit one of the uh, the uh, rapid fire questions I was going to ask you, and uh, you know, are you do you still get stumped? Oh, go, oh goodness, yes. Yeah, hey, yeah. Thank think, you. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think I, I've spent uh, I don't know, the last ten years. I had a I had a hip replaced, my own hip replaced, probably thirteen or so years ago. And by default, I became the hip PT in Southern Maine uh, for for a lot of the <laughs> joint replacement guys. Um, and uh, you know the the ambiguous coccyx salt hands, you know, situations of internal, you know, inter intermedial hip pain. Uh, think of the post, post hip, think of the potential origin of that irritation. You know, is it, you know, is it bone prosthetic junction? You know, is it that origin? Is it capsule? Is it that origin? Uh, is it venomous? Is, is it versatile? Is it, you know, is it referral? Is it, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, there are, there are a lot of levels to dive into uh, in that situation as an example, uh, where things can, can really stump you, um, where you swear it is coming from a certain issue 
landmark um and you know you treat it and you get nowhere so yeah. it's yeah yeah I, I, I thought that was going to work and it didn't and uh, yeah and then of course you're dealing with a patient who you know just spent whatever time and effort and is nowhere and of course you know, they're they want to address the problem and never, never go away so yeah so to all our listeners um <clears throat> it doesn't matter how much experience you have there's always going to be something that's going to pop up you're always going to be challenged and you can just, you can blow it off and you can just go on to the next patient or you can take that challenge on and, and work at it. Um, it wasn't too long ago. I had somebody, I had somebody come through. It was a, it was a young athlete who came through with, uh, you know, unusual metatarsal pain and um, come to find out uh, seven or eight friends of theirs had the same amount of pain in the same area. And uh, then from there, that led into what did you all do that was similar? And they all used the same hot tub and ended up with something called hot tub, hot foot syndrome. And it was a bacterial infection that goes through the skin, especially for younger folks who um, are a little more tender there. And uh, it presents like an arthralgia in the feet. And uh, it was just, you know, I'd never seen anything like that before. And I took one of our athletic trainers to dig this out and uh, and help us figure this out and uh, was, you, you'll always get stumped uh, as you get older and as you experience more you get stumped less often um you have you know you you you've seen something in the past you put that in your memory bank and when it comes up again it's there and uh then that may happen three or four times in your career but then you can address that a lot faster and get it evaluated better because we all know there's like seven or eight reasons why people don't get better. And the number one reason is poor diagnosis. And so I think that if you can become a better diagnostician, your treatment uh, process will just become much better and much more efficient. And um, if you don't know what it is, your patient will appreciate that you take the time to go find out what it is and uh, and that that'll go a long way. And, and, and you know, Kurt and I are physical therapists. This this is for all of you medical providers out there. I don't care if you are a, a dentist or if you are a speech therapist or physical therapist or occupational therapist, athletic trainer, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it really comes down to, you know, uh, detective work, getting a good evaluation in, diagnosing it, and then uh, moving forward with uh, appropriate treatment. So. Well, as you were telling that story, I was pretty convinced when you talked about numerous people with metatarsalgia that you were going to say they all were employed by the circus and they were all firewalkers. Yep. So I didn't expect the hot tub answer at all. Hey, I'll tell you what, but those hot tubs are dangerous. I don't have one because a, I've seen way too many bad things. A, come that's from a new one. That's a new one for me right there. That's a new one. See, Kurt, you learn something every day. I'm glad you there came you on go. the show. That's it. Yeah. The day has now not can, been wasted. Perfect. Now you can go home and tell your, your wife, you know, what you learned today at, on the Ortho Eval Val podcast. Out. Stay out of the tub. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. So now um, we're going to put you on the hot seat, Kurt, and I'm going to throw out some rapid fire questions. You're probably going to hate me by the time we're done, uh, but please do your Just, best. Uh, pay back for your uh, interview process before you. Oh, enter with us, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, Not cool. only did Kurt interview me, but when his coworkers came in, he had them interview me and pummel me with questions. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it was specific. It was like exactly what angle should you do this at and what should you do that at it? I mean, it was great. I loved it. And um, and because of that, that's how I um, confront a lot of our new students. And uh, we have a little packet of questions that we have them go through. First day they come in, you're not allowed to look at Google. You're not allowed to open your books or anything. Answer these questions and we just get an idea how they how they're doing you know what's their knowledge like and then yeah. um at the end of their clinical they take those questions again and we see how they do yeah and, perfect um I, I i think we need to know where people stand we can't just assume that because you and i we we, we got a, we had our bachelor's of science in physical therapy and now students are you know my daughter is going in to be a, a dpt in physical therapy she's in her fifth year and and, you know, it's, it's just like, how different was it then to, to now? And um, so I think that, uh, you know, we need to, we need to look at uh, pushing ourselves. And, and if we're going to be, if we're going to have people out there who are doctors in physical therapy, they've, they've got to show that they are, and uh, we need to stand up for our profession and just continue doing the best that we can do. Yeah, super important. Yep. So rapid fire questions. Here we go. Number one. How many years of PT practice did you work until you felt 100% confident with your diagnoses of patients? 
Uh, let's see. I retired after 35, I'd say 34 and a half. <laughs> That's great. I think there's been some research out there and, uh, and some surveys that have been done to physical therapists who have a lot of experience. And the average has been 10 years, um, you know, feeling, you know, 10 years before you felt absolutely confident. Um, and, and I think right. with certain diagnoses, it's easier to do earlier, oh, but um with the majority of things, I can tell, you, I can tell you for me, it was not 10 years. It was definitely not 10 years. So, you know, before I felt like I was nailing 95% things accurately, uh, it was not 10 years. Was, yep. Um, yep. Um, what's your favorite soft tissue modality? You know, people are going to poo poo me, uh, but I'm a STEM guy. I am an electrical STEM guy. I, I just think. Um, you know, irregardless of the research in terms of what truly happens with activating those pathways, I think it's a great biofeedback mechanism. Um, yeah. And I think it's a great, uh, it's a useful time saver uh, when you're trying to um, juggle, you know, a couple of patients at the same time doing different things. I think you don't need to feel bad or guilty that you're doing that someone, one of your patients is doing something uh, that isn't high quality or worth anything while you're hands-on with somebody else. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think as an unattended modality, it's, it's hugely useful um, and uh, efficacious. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a big electrical STEM guy. Yeah. So, so am I, you know, if anything, if this podcast is doing anything for me today, it's confirming that um, what I continue to do is still falling in the realm of what, um, you know, really super smart people like yourself are doing. And uh, I, you know, again, experience, uh, I have seen people respond really well to that. The reimbursement isn't great on it. So, you know, and no, it's, not, not like we're, not, it's not like we're charging a hundred bucks a, a pop here when we're doing East Tim. Um, you're not, you're not doing it for the money. You're doing it as an unintended modality to, to cut you a little slack in terms of how you schedule your day. And uh, you know, it's something, it's something the patient can't get at home. Um, the research certainly uh, is not anti stem uh, if you look at some of the spinal cord papers, at least uh, some of those research papers, you know the, the evidence is is pretty uh, is pretty positive in terms of its of its benefit. Um, so um, so yeah, I think a, a useful useful modality that uh, that certainly has enough uh, enough research behind it to, to justify its use. If you're yep. not not feeling bad about uh, checking that uh, uh, that CPT code at the end of the day. Yep. Yep, totally agreed. Um, your favorite diagnosis to treat? Favorite to treat? Um, well, I guess I'd have to say that is probably posterior tibial tendonitis, um, just because these people have seen a bunch of different practitioners. They've gotten uh, different song and dance from every single one of them. Uh, no one has really a, taken a, a serious look at their you know, the foot ankle architecture um, in terms of subtalar activity and uh, what's going on with first ray and what's going on further up the chain, um, everything from hips on down. Um, so I think most people, when they get a really thorough biomechanical evaluation or extremity, um, and come up with a with a treatment uh, approach that includes, you know, working decelerators and orthotic imp implementation. Uh, and they get results, you know, shoe wear and whatever, all, all the ingredients. Um, after struggling with something like this for a couple of years, they're just super happy. And uh, yep. you know, it's, a, it's a really, really good sense of accomplishment. I think when you go somewhere no one else has gone before and come up with a, with a good solution for them. Yeah. Yeah, as they post your tip, it's pretty fun. Yeah. That sounds like a, a great topic for another podcast yeah. sometime. Uh, we could, we could dig deep on that. I'd like to, I'd love to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, it could All be. Right. Super. What's your nemesis of a diagnosis? What's your worst diagnosis out there? Back pain, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, not not radiculopathy back pain. You know, that's that's easy to treat. Yeah. Um, or decide what to do with it, at least. It's just that centralized low back pain, you know, that just you know, just comes out of nowhere and has been unresponsive to everything we've had in the past. And uh, you know, I've always I've always kind of blamed it on on annular sprains and posterior posterior wall dysfunction. But you know, how do we know? You know, there's yep. there's so many potential culprits there. Um, and the exam tools are aren't awesome. 
uh, in terms of specificity and sensitivity, I don't think. Um, so, you, you know, that's that's where you really get down to the art of uh, being a clinician versus uh, versus being a true scientist, because uh, the deeper you dig uh, with that kind of situation to isolate the problem tissue, uh, the more disappointed you're going to be probably. It really becomes a, a treatment design of, uh, okay, that hurts, don't do that. That feels good, let's do that instead. It's, yeah. you know, couldn't get uh, couldn't get any simpler really yeah uh, yeah i think it's that just that centralized low back lumbago yeah yep. no particular reason yep. all right your favorite pastime favorite pastime yeah um sports you know i think in in order i guess as a as a master's athlete um you know, nordic skiing has been in, uh, been part of my life now for for so many years and alpine skiing as well and gotten into uh, some masters bike racing and uh, yeah, so kind of I guess skiing and cycling, sure. Yeah. Awesome, great. Okay, best PT student you ever had? You? <laughs> uh, I was just throwing that out there just to really put you on the spot. You, you know, knew, I know you you're knew I, You knew what I was going to say, and I'll I'll tell you, Paul. And I say that it's it's not a joke. Um, I don't know if you remember when I had your aunt. Yeah, remember? Yes. Yes. Asian? Yes. And that was about the era, I think, when you came on as one of our interns. And uh, I think I had seen her um, following your time with us. And uh, she was inquisitive. She said, yeah, how's my, how's my nephew Paul doing? How do you do? And I said, you know what, Jan? I said, at this point, he is the best intern we've ever had. He's had, he's had. And, you know, she would say, why? Why? Hey, what well, comes down to being inquisitive, being interactive, both with you know, clinicians and patients. Uh, and anytime I asked him a question and he said he didn't know, he didn't ask me for the answer, he went to go find it. Or at least he asked me, where can I go find it? And, you know, as a, as a self-learner, and, uh, you know, those are the people who make the best interests. People that when they don't know something, don't ask you for the answer as their mentor, or as their, as their uh, clinical instructor. Uh, they may say, should I go look for that here? Or they don't ask anything. They just go dig and find it. Um, well, those, those are the game, good interns. And the yep. ones that well, don't want to spoon fed, they want to find it out for themselves. So. Yep. Yeah, I think it's the best way to learn. And I didn't set that that question up to pat myself on the back. I just, uh, you know. You just got patted. Of, so. it, was, it, was, it, was, it was just fun, yeah. Deservedly slow, deservedly so. Yeah, um, right. yeah no, it was, it was a great time. And uh, I learned uh, a ton and I, I i know that i i would have loved to have worked with you soon after college and uh didn't have not we, we've had some because, we've had some good ones over the years we've had yeah. some good ones over the years we really have yeah we, now we you you folks have really uh been well known for for excellent practice um so next question your favorite acl graft uh i'm gonna get flack for this but i love hamstrings from from a situation of being able to rehab them uh hamstrings for sure um, you know self-armor morbidity is is still an issue and i realize you know there's certain populations that really shouldn't be getting hamstrings or can't get hamstrings um and that btb is still still the gold standard um but uh, i i would rehab an adult hamstring graph over you know, tell, you know, telegraph any day of the week for sure yep and the last question I have for you, uh, best advice you can give a young medical provider who is just starting out in the medical field now? Uh, just know it's you're signing on, you're signing on for your life. Uh, and, you know, I hope that you enjoy science. Uh, I hope you enjoy studying the art of movement, uh, maybe athletic movements, maybe non-athletic movements, but you just that whole the whole mechanical situation uh, intrigues you and that uh, this is going to be a lifelong learning situation where things change. And, you know, there's a standing joke around, around my house where, uh, you know, my wife is a, a rabid reader and you know, she say, what's the last book you've read? And I said, I don't read books. I just don't read books. I, if I read, it's a journal. Uh, you know, I'm not at the beach, it's a journal. If I'm on a plane, it's a journal. And she just, she razzes me, don't you really want to, you know, become more worldly and read a book? And I said, yeah, maybe someday. But 
you know, right now I just feel guilty if I'm reading a book when I should be reading a journal. Um, yeah. And I enjoy reading it. It's not because it's not, it's not a chore. It's just like, yeah, I should read that article. And you do. And next thing you know, you're into it. And, you know, maybe you go as far as the abstract and you put it down. Or maybe just say, that is cool stuff. I'm going to keep going. Um, so, yeah, just if you're, if you're coming into the profession, know that you're signing on or should be signing on for life. Um, and you will enjoy it. You should enjoy it. You will enjoy it. And it's not, you're not doing it for a paycheck. Um, you're doing you're doing it for a lot of other reasons absolutely absolutely and uh we were like we were talking about earlier before we even started the podcast you know it's uh you you get to a point in your career where you know fueling that that fire can sometimes be a little bit difficult you you can have a little fatigue but um in the morning i always get up and i always get excited about coming to work and uh sometimes it's it's about you know, throwing something else in there, like you are, you know, training folks on a higher level, you know, between, uh, between therapy and getting back to their sports. And mine is, you know, podcasting and YouTubing about different diagnoses. And like you, I have a JOSPT on my nightstand, um, you know, and uh, sometimes I like the article, sometimes I don't, but hey, you know, uh, you keep involved and uh, that's what makes you better. And that's what makes you happy and passionate about what you do. And it doesn't matter what profession you're in, uh, you know, this, this just uh, works with, uh, with anything out there. So, um, Kurt, I can't thank you enough for being on today's show. I really appreciate all your time and your expertise and, um, you know, your willingness to get back to me when I give you a phone call and say, hey, Kurt, you know, I've got a challenging case here. I just need your input. And um, you've always been there. And I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. It's it's great. I think that uh, people look up to that and uh, it helps to drive them forward and, and harder as it has for me. Um, so if if somebody, you know, wanted to get in touch with you about uh, any of the stuff we talked about today, are you okay with uh, me giving them your email address? Uh, can absolutely, I put that? Absolutely. Throw, out, throw the email out there. And at this point, I don't have a website specific to Jepson PT Consultants is what I'm uh, the name I've, I've set up. Um, uh, so I'm using LinkedIn. That's kind of, uh, kind of my go-to page for, uh, for information, scheduling, whatever, how to get hold of me. So, uh, yep. I have folks, uh, already LinkedIn me uh, members, uh, just go ahead and search me that way. Or if you're not LinkedIn members, uh, have them sign up. It's pretty painless and it's not, uh, there's no fee associated with it. Um, get on LinkedIn and track me down for sure. Yep. Super. I'll put some links in the show notes today of today's podcast so that uh, if you did want to get in touch with Kurt, you know, go ahead and uh, send a message to him. If you wanted to get through to him through me, that's fine. Uh, get in touch with me. You know how to do that. And uh, folks, don't be afraid to send over your questions, any orthopedic questions you might have um, for us to put on the show. I'd be more than happy to uh, dig deep, make sure that we get you some good information. And um, if we ever make a mistake on the show, or you say, you know, Paul said, something I really don't agree with. Hey, don't be afraid, you know, uh, shoot that over to me and uh, we'll have a conversation about it. I think that uh, the more we converse, the more we collaborate, uh, the more we learn. And it all comes down to one thing. Okay. Getting our patients better. They are number one here. And uh, that's why we do what we do. And so we can only do that better uh, when we continue to learn more and, uh, and learn from people who are experienced like uh, Kurt and, and all those other folks out there who are super passionate about what they do. So again, Kurt, thank you so much for being on today's show. And um, for all of you who are listening, thanks for listening. And we appreciate you being there. Have a great day and take care. Thank you. Paul.